Good day, these great surgeons with you all a lot. Let's all together gather up today to discuss a very beloved topic for every surgeon, the trauma. It's lovely to study trauma, but it requires a brutal heart to practice trauma. But it's imaginable, unmatchable feeling when you help a patient in the emergency and feeling of satisfaction like never before. So let's work on our trauma and emergence chapter together. Together we can with the grace of God. By the way, there will be no exam without a Glasgow coma scale, either directly about asking you to score the patient or indirectly by asking you a correct regarding some numbers within the Glasgow coma scale. In the Glasgow coma scale, we have three aspect and three modalities to evaluate the eye opening the verbal rep response and the motor response the eye opening have four scores the verbal response have five scores and the motor response has six scores and by the way the least score in glasgow coma given to a dead person is three there is no zero in glasgow coma scale as if the doctor who created the glasgow coma scale does need to give anyone even the dead one a score with at least three there is no zero in glasgow coma scale so never give anyone you you encounter in your life a zero score in your life always give him at least three if he is dead person for you he still have three things for you so regarding the glasgow coma scale the eye opening and the verbal response and motor response it's very hard for many to remember, so let's have a trick. If there is no response at all, if he is dead, give him one for each score, so it's a three. And let's take it from the normal. If he is normal, he will be 15. So if he normal, we will have a normal eye opening spontaneously. The verbal response will be oriented and talk with you, and the motor response will be obeying your command, but if deteriorated, he won't open his eyes until you talk to him, to speech. And if he deteriorated more, he won't open his eyes unless he is in pain. And the last thing, he won't open his eyes to any response, either to speech and no pain. So, eye opening will be spontaneous, or to speech, or pain, or not at all. In order, revise them. And the verbal response the same way. He is oriented and talking with you, or confused, or saying a word. Just words that has nothing related to each other, or sound like, like this. He is not talking any language. It sounds, or none at all. The verbal response have five. Either he is oriented and, uh, and responding to every question you ask. That's why we talk about the patient there is a, like a, a phrase we talk as a routine when we are talking about the patient. That the patient is alert, conscious, oriented to time, place, and person. This is a verbal response. Ask the patient, is he oriented with time, place, and person? Or he is confused. He doesn't know what is today. You ask him, what is today? And he responds, today is Sunday. And eventually, at least, we are Monday today. So he is confused. He does know some answers and ask, uh, answer your question, but confused, not the correct answer. Why the word is, he answers with irrelevant words. So you ask him, what is your name? He answers you, Monday. So this is another word not related or talking in a phrase not related to each other. He says Monday gone to Tuesday. Uh, Monday, of course, doesn't go to Tuesday. They are days, but they don't visit each other. And sounds, it incomprehensible sounds, or not at all. Those are the five scores for verbal response. Why the motor response, if the patient obeys commands, or localizes pain, or withdraws from pain, or abnormal flexion to pain, or extension to pain. The confusion always in the motor response in the score from two to three, which is extension to pain, or abnormal flexion. Abnormal flexion, is better than the extension of pain because abnormal flexion he is taking a defense when you taking a defense yes you take your arms to your chest while when you are 
defenseless you are extending and you are surrendering to pain so never surrender and obey command localize the pain withdraw from pain or flexion to pain or extension to pain or none at all those are the six grades so four i five verbal six motor four i five verbal six motor from all of this we want to stress that you have to talk the glasgow coma scale questions because they are a must in the exam believe me there is no exam in mrcs without glasgow coma scale and the cut off number in glasgow coma scale is eight if below eight intubate below eight the patient's confused and will be desaturating and requires patency of airway preservation so if eight intubate this is a cut off and the importance of glasgow coma scale so zero in glasgow coma scale denotes what it denotes that this surgeon didn't study his glasgow coma scale well and doesn't know that the dead person gets a three there is no zero in glasgow coma scale so don't be this surgeon and by the way if it's not applicable you write it's not applicable there is no zero in glasgow coma scale again someone asks me how can glasgow coma scale be not applicable for example a patient having a macroglossia he can't open his mouth he can't talk and produce sounds because he has a laryngeal edema or tongue edema how can he talk if a patient having a puffy eye he has hematoma eye or edematous bilateral eye so you can't assess the eye response movement or the eye opening so this glasgow coma scale will be inapplicable in case you forget the motor response remember this song obey six flies five withdraw four Abnormal three extends to none at all. Obey six flies five, withdraw four. Abnormal three, extend to none one. Obey six flies five, withdraw four. Abnormal three, extend to none one. For the verbal response, remember this song as well. Oriented five confused four, word three sound to none one. The common song will be none one. So, verbal response song. Oriented five confused four, word three, two sound. None one. The motor response. Obey six. Localize five. Withdraw four. Norma three. Extend to none one. So, Oriented five, confused four, word three, sound two, none one, obey six, localized five, withdraw four, abnormal three, extended to none one. And for the eyes opening song, spontaneous four, p three, two, pain, none one. Let's have a practical example. Spontaneous eye movement, giving verbal response with sounds and motor response extension to pain let's sing our song to this patient spontaneous four sounds to extends to it's four two two spontaneous four sounds to extends to these are eight and if eight into eight so during your exam take your keyword and sing the song and you will get it everyone during his exam is not allowed to sing or talk by the way in the online edition so sing in your soul let's now talk about a very critical topic in mrcs trauma the splenic trauma spleen and liver are the most organs that can be injured during high energy trauma and causes most of the intra visceral uh, fluid collection post traumatic due to visceral injury so the most common in organ to be injured post traumatic is the spleen so the spleen is one of the most commonly injured intra abdominal organs in most cases the spleen can be conserved by the way so the management is dictated by the associated injuries and the hemodynamic status of the patient and the direct splenic injury extension when to manage the trauma patient with conservative when he has a splenic trauma let's see 
we have either to conserve the patient or do laboratory with conservation or resection. It all depends on the certain scenario. If there is a small subcapsular hematoma with minimal intra-abdominal blood or no hyalur disruption, then conserve the patient. But take care. If there is increased amount of intra-abdominal blood or moderate hemodynamic compromisation with tears or laceration affecting less than 50%, Go for laboratory to remove this hematoma and inspect the spleen with your eyes. And you can go either conservative or manage with splenectomy. But take care if there is a high blood injury or major hemorrhage or major associated injuries affecting more than 50%, go for the section of the spleen. And by the way, mobilizing the spleen will result in removal of the spleen. Don't disrupt an organized hematoma within the spleen when you are planning for preservation. Removal of the spleen is not the best thing you can do for life. It can be expandable organ and remove it, yes, like the gallbladder or the appendicitis, but take care. During removal, there might be a complication from hemorrhage, maybe early or either from the short gastric or splenic hyalur vessel or even pancreatic fistula can occur, so take care. The pancreatic tail might be injured during splenectomy from iatrogenic damage to pancreatic tail. Even thrombocytosis and take care that encapsulated bacterial infection or OPSI can occur. Oops, can occur, overwhelming, can cause by splenectomy. Stripped pneumonia, and hemophilus. So, encapsulated bacterial infection can occur after a splenectomy like streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitis, and that's why it's advised to take the prophylactic vaccines after splenectomy with two weeks, or if it was elective operation, you can take the vaccination pre-operatively with two weeks. A very common question regarding the spleen is giving platelets to the patient is introduced at the very moment you are clamping the vessels. Two clamps on the patient side are better and allow for a double ligation and serve as safety net if your assistant doesn't release the clamp smoothly. And by the way, you have to be cautious because the pancreatic tail is very common to be injured during splenectomy. If you do, then this will need to be formally removed and the pancreatic duct will be needed to be closed. What is OPSI that can occur post splenectomy? It's an overwhelming post splenectomy infection. So OPSI can occur as an oops after splenectomy. So please give the patient his vaccinations and penicillin post-operative. It's a rare but rapidly fatal infection occurring in individuals following the removal of their spleens. Infections are typically characterized by either meningitis or sepsis and are caused by encapsulated organisms. The most infection occur in the first few years following the splenectomy. We are not talking about a post-operative complication in the first early two weeks. We are talking about first few years, so take care. Both splenectomy opsy can occur. It's rare, but keep it in mind. Once an infection occurs, the mortality rate is high, ranging from 38 to 69 percent, and fulminant infection frequently develop in patients who are relatively young. That's why splenectomy is not the first option, both traumatic. Take care and assess your patient well does he need splenectomy or not? Regarding post trauma, how could you know that this patient might be having a splenic injury? Take care. Any patient post trauma comes to you in the ER, you follow the ATLS protocol APC airway, pressing check, circulation check. And during circulation, you do the FAST or the E FAST to include investigation for the pneumothorax, as we mentioned before. In this stage, this is the first thing to be done, ultrasound, 
the first thing to be done post-traumatic for investigating an intravisceral trauma will be ultrasound. A CT can be done, but after the ultrasound or the ultrasound, it didn't give us a sufficient data. And by the way, take care. For a pregnant female post-traumatic, this is the only excuse that you might be in need for a CT. I know that CT carry some significant dose of radiation, but here we are talking about a life saving for a pregnant lady and her fetus. We are talking about two patients, not one. So the CT now will be a must for this pregnant patient to investigate her, but become the first priority to be the ultrasound. But the definitive will be the CT. Another trick regarding the pregnant patient, as long as we brought it up, if we are investigating a female patient for intra-abdominal collection, the CT will be more sensitive. If we are investigating a pregnant lady with suspecting perforated peptic ulcer, what is the most correct and most sensitive? Also the CT, go with CT. And by the way, this is a recurrent recall and you have to take care from it. Clear? Take care regarding another trick of splenectomy. After a splenectomy, there will be a changes in the blood film. Take care from them. There will be a whole jolly bodies, as well as there will be a sides. And in case you forget, never forget the hind's body. Splenectomy goes after it a hind's body catch-up. There will be increase in the catch-up of the blood. The hind's, not the catch-up. So keep this in mind. So there will be a reticulocytosis, howl jolly bodies, sidrocytes, hind's body, as well as bukilocytosis. All of those will be like new changes following splenectomy in the blood cell. Keep them in mind and they are frequently asked. Always take care that any patient with a splenic trauma that you decided to manage conservatively, this doesn't mean that this patient go home. He must be under monitored to visualize and to assess and reassess and monitor the vital signs of the patient. Because at any time this patient might collapse or have a hemodynamic instability and requires later on any surgical intervention. So admitting any patient for a conservative management means admitting the patient at the hospital, not at home. And if the patient refuses, he might sign the DAMA as he refuses the medical care. Take care. This great surgeon, take care. After trauma, you have to believe that the vital signs are critical and vital for the patient, for your own practice. If the patient is confused or losing his conscious, take his vital sign. If the patient is hypovolemic, think of visceral injury. If the patient is hypertensive, think for intracranial increased pressure. This is a critical sign for your assessment of the patient. Is the patient hypertensive post-traumatic? This is unlikely. Most probably the patient must be hypovolemic from loss of blood, either from a hemorrhage intra uh, visceral or from an external wound. So if the patient is hypertensive, this is an intracranial pressure increase. Think of Cushing triad. So in Cushing triad will be increasing the systolic blood pressure and low pulse and low respiratory rate. Those indicating this patient is going through Cushing triad due to increase in the intracranial pressure. While shock will be low blood pressure, high pulse, and high respiratory rate. Don't confuse the Cushing triad with the Bexa triad. Bexa triad for the cardiac tamponade, while Cushing triad for increased intracranial tension. Cushing triad will be bradycardia bradypnea and systolic hypertension while the pexy triad will be having a hypotension with a jugular venous distension and distant hard sound which is muffled hard sound the most common intracranial injury will be extradural hematoma and it's most probably due to a middle meningeal artery injury 
where by a person who got lucky enough to be hit as a Tyrion. Remember the Tyrion? We discussed it in details in anatomy. Yes, the Tyrion is the region where the frontal and parietal and the temporal bone with the greater wing of the sphenoid bone join together to form the Tyrion point, the weakest point in the skull where we have our lucky meningeal middle meningeal artery which a branch from the maxillary artery which is divided by the lateral trigoid muscle which is the small muscle which opens your mouth and yes now you are surprised opening your mouth that the whole medicine is connected and the extradural hematoma from the middle meningeal artery is the most common cause to cause intracranial hemorrhage take care and by the way it's characterized by the lucid interval so a man hit on his side of the head he now present to the emergency department with old behavior complaining of headaches he became drowsy and unresponsive what is this underlying injury yes it's extradural hematoma extradural hematoma it's a bleeding into the space between the dura mater and the skull it often results from the acceleration deceleration trauma or a blow to the side of the head as the terion. The majority of the extradural hematoma occur at the temporal region where the skull fracture causes a rupture of the middle meningeal artery which is a branch from the maxillary artery which is divided into three parts by the lateral trigoid muscle and the features of the extradural hematoma will be increased intracranial pressure and there will be a coaching triad as well as the, some patient may exhibit the lucid interval and subdural hematoma is a different thing from the extradural hematoma subdural hematoma is a bleeding into the outermost meningeal layer most commonly occur around the frontal and parietal loop it may be either acute or chronic the risk factor include old age or alcoholism the slower onset of symptoms indicating that this might be subdural hematoma because it has slower onset of incidence than the extradural hematoma. A very famous exam scenario. In the exam, you will find that he telling you an athletic patient. He was having a marathon and suddenly he collapsed and died. This is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Typical scenario in the exam records and real exam and real life. Unfortunately, this patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage and usually occurs spontaneously in the context of a ruptured cerebral aneurysm, like the perianeurysm. And if a patient have a polycystic kidney, he might have a perianeurysm. And perianeurysm, if he had it and you have survived this patient with the perianeurysm and saved his life, look for the polycystic kidney because he will die from a polycystic kidney so if he didn't die from renal failure he will die from subarachnoid hemorrhage by the perianeurysm but may be seen in association with other injury when a patient has sustained traumatic brain injury increased intracranial blood pressure is life-threatening especially in extradural hematoma and in the exam and in the theater you have to transfuse the patient and arrange the patient with IV manitol or furosemide to decrease the intracranial pressure. Diffuse cerebral edema may require a decompressive craniotomy. And even extrapolatory bear holes were having a little management in the little practice except when scanning may be unavailable. Like Dr. Howe's famous um, episode he did a telemedicine and told the patient to do an exploratory per hole for herself because it, she was having an extra dural hematoma who can remember this episode so if we do have a patient with a depressed skull fracture if it's open so it will require a formal surgical reduction and debridement of course but if it's closed injury it may be managed non-operatively if there is a minimal displacement of this depressed fracture. But take care from the patient intracranial potential hemorrhage. So a patient with polycystic kidney 
If he survives the renal failure, he will die from perianeurysm with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And if he survives the perianeurysm and the polycystic kidney, he might die from coarctation of the aorta. This patient is pretty lucky. By the way, the adult polycystic kidney disease is bilaterally, and this is an autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. By the way, it's inevitable. By the way, the presentation of the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease will vary from age of 15 to 30 year old man. If he survived and wasn't lucky enough to die earlier from perianeurysm, he will die from this autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease at age of 30. Like Anwar Wagdi, the famous Egyptian actor or the, the grandson of uh, the former president uh, Hosni Mubarak, he did die from a very aneurysm and he couldn't save his life. So the grandson of the president didn't survive from very aneurysm. A very famous actor, Anwar Wagdi, he died from polycystic kidney disease. If he is lucky enough, he will die earlier from very aneurysm. If he is not lucky to die at childhood, he will die from polycystic kidney renal failure at his adulthood and he will have many other congenital anomaly like coarctation of aorta. This is great surgeon take care from the lethal triad acidosis coagulopathy and hypothermia. So hypothermia is not joke when we have a patient who is entrapped in ice it will cause him hypothermia it's one of the critical jo no joke to deal with it's one of the critical lethal triad. Hypothermia, the body core temperature will be below 35 Celsius. This will cause a severe hypothermia and present when the core temperature is below 28 Celsius. Please don't wait the patient to reach below 28 Celsius and if he's trapped in ice, he will have his temperature below zero. He will be literally sub-zero from mortal combat. Take care. There are stages for hypothermia. If the patient temperature from 32 to 35, he will be awake but shivering. This is mild. And from 28 to 32, he will be drowsy but not shivering. And this is moderate. And from 20 to 28, this is severe. He will be then not shivering and unconscious. So if in ice you face a drowsy one, this is moderate. If he is unconscious, he will die in peace. He is not shivering. This is not a good sign. So if you found a patient awake and shivering, this is a mild hypothermia and good thing. His temperature is about 32 to 35. Less than 20. Close his eye and leave him go away. He has no vital sign. This is profound hypothermia. Dear is great surgeon, take care. A very tricky question regarding hypothermia in the exam. What is the first response from the body in response to hypothermia? It will be, guess what, vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction occurs before shivering. So at first there will be vasoconstriction and the trial of the patient to do thermogenesis, then shivering occurs. This is the first response to hypothermia. While in hyperthermia, he will start with sweating, then vasodilatation. Keep in mind what happens first because it's very critical, common question in the exam. How to manage a hypothermia? Take care. An organized cardiac rhythm may be converted to fibrillation if the CBR is attempted inappropriately, so the ECG should be analyzed with care. The reward main technique used in hypothermic patients depend upon the degree of the hypothermia. That's why we gave degrees and the classification for the hypothermia. It's not for literature, it's for the management. Whenever there is a classification, it's for management. So, if a mild hypothermia, it may respond to external rewarming devices. While severe hypothermia, where you have the patient is unconscious and not shivering at all, this is severe one. He is temperature is below 20, from 20 to 28, he is severely hypothermic, and this is from the lethal triad, hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. This patient requires a good care. So, 
This patient, severe hypothermia, might require active core rewarming. We can achieve an active core rewarming technique with proteinial lavage and hemodialysis or even a cardiac bypass. We need in this patient skin and internal visceral, the core temperature must be high, not only the skin. Or you will go make a patient barbecue and burn the patient. Don't burn the patient, but go for peritoneal lavage. The patient who develop a cardiac arrhythmia, who are severely hypothermic, may respond to petroleum tooth light, which is sadly no longer available in most centers. The petroleum tooth light but don't generally respond to standard therapy or DC cardioversion. So, hypothermia, did you believe now that it's one of the lethal threat? I'm so amazed from your writing notes. This makes your study unmatchable. So happy with you. Always take screenshots and write your own notes. Those are the true pearls to your MRCS exam. And whatever exam you take, always have your own notes what do you think all the notes available in the market or sold by anyone those are the self notes your self notes are a true treasure they are valuable more than you can think of another question famous for the hypothermia what are the waves associated with the hypothermia in ECG of course we have the J waves so the J waves, if you found it in the ECG, it's a pathognomonic for hypothermia. From time to time, we will collect the ECG signs are important for the MRCS exam. So shell out and don't fear the ECG. You will be the king of ECG of MRCS by the end of your study wave. God willing, together we can. Good day, there is great surgeon. You can follow all of the hashtag to scroll through the previous sessions. And you can go through the YouTube channel to listen to our voice shots combined as a lecture like. Hope you like it. And follow the interactive schedule guide. It will have everything and a little bit detailed to what to do and how to use it. God be with you and together we can.